Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 181, Duck and the Quack Attack. One morning, Duck the Great Western Engine was puffing down the line with his morning train. The birds were chirping, the cows were mooing, it was a splendid day. Crack! Something broke and Duck screeched to a sudden stop. What was that? he exclaimed. His driver and fireman got out and looked around. After a few minutes of talking between themselves, they turned to Duck with some bad news. Your back wheel has cracked, said his driver sternly, likely due to some debris on the line back there. We'll have to get this fixed up immediately. Well, that can wait, said Duck quickly. I need to get my passengers to the station. His fireman chuckled. You won't be going anywhere with a broken wheel, he smiled. It's best if we just wait for some help to come along. Duck sighed and let off a billowing cloud of steam. The once pleasant cows were becoming rather annoying. They wouldn't stop mooing no matter how hard he tried to weesh at them. This is ridiculous, he finally admitted. I'm not going to let a small imperfection keep me from doing my job. His driver and fireman barely climbed aboard in time as Duck slowly puffed away. It was a hard and slow journey, and Duck's crew spent the majority of the time yelling at their engine to stop immediately. At last, although he was very late indeed, Duck finally made it to Tidmouth Station where Henry was waiting. Where have you been? he asked impatiently. I had a slight mechanical problem, gasped Duck. Nothing to worry about, however. Just then, he noticed Stanley and Bertie chuckling off to the side. What's the matter? inquired Duck. Why are you laughing at me? Oh, nothing, muttered Stanley. Just something Bertie and I saw when you pulled in. Duck weeshed loudly. If you must happen to know, I've cracked a wheel, and that's why the train is late. We know that, laughed Bertie. We could see you waddling from a mile away. Henry started chuckling as well. They're right, you know, he said, smiling. Duck was confused. He moved forward and noticed that his body rocked from side to side as he did so. The engines were making fun of him for wobbling along the rails. Oh, very funny, said Duck. And I suppose none of you have ever had something go wrong when pulling a train. Isn't that right, Henry? But Henry didn't care. He's waddling, he laughed. Duck, the great western engine, is actually waddling down the track. The engines burst out into laughter, and Duck puffed away as fast as his crooked wheel could carry him. That night, instead of joining his friends at the sheds, Duck chose to spend the evening alone at Olstead Castle. He was incredibly embarrassed by what had happened. Of course it had to happen right in front of Henry, he muttered to himself. Now I'm sure he's gone off and told every single engine on the island about my waddle. His driver and fireman attempted to soothe him. Cheer up, they said. In the morning, we'll go see Sir Topham Hatt and ask him for a quick repair at the works. That way, we'll hopefully be back in time for your evening train. Yes, that sounds lovely, agreed Duck. He was feeling much more confident than before. But the next day, when Duck arrived at Natford, Sir Topham Hatt was already waiting for him. Ah, so it is true, he muttered quickly, and I thought it was just a rumor. Anyway, Duck, I hear that you have a cracked wheel or something. Yes, I do, insisted Duck. I ran over something yesterday, and I need repairs right away. Well, I'm sorry to tell you this, but the works is too crowded at the moment. Victor has his hands full with his new job, and Stephen's restoration is taking longer than expected. I'll get you in as soon as possible, but until then, you'll have to work in the yard here where you won't run into more trouble. Trouble, weesh duck crossly. But, sir, that's enough, said Sir Topham Hatt. One more odd bump in the track like yesterday, and you'll go flying off the rails and cause yourself even more damage. Sir Topham Hatt walked away and Duck sighed. If the engines hadn't heard about his misfortune from Henry, they certainly had now. A broken wheel, laughed Gordon. 
Good thing Sir Topham Hatt is keeping you away from the dangerous world out there. It's much safer here in the yard with Stafford and Rosie. Yeah, agreed James. We wouldn't want you running over a twig and hurting your smoke box. That would be embarrassing. Much like those leaves that one time on Gordon's Hill, eh, James? asked Thomas. James bristled at the remark and puffed quickly away. Duck was still left feeling down. Don't you worry, said Thomas cheerfully. I'm sure Sir Topham Hatt will have you back on your branch line in no time. Thanks, Thomas, said Duck sadly. No offense to your coaches or anything, but the yard is the last place I want to be right now. It's been years since I've worked here, and I really don't want to do it again. I'm sure Rosie and Stafford will keep you company, said Thomas optimistically. And Thomas was right, except for the fact that Stafford and Rosie played games all day. Duck was left doing the hard work, and his cracked wheel wasn't helping. Eventually, he had had enough. You know what, he told Ryan. Sir Topham Hatt can't turn me away from the works if I somehow end up there. Puffing there myself would take too long, and my broken wheel wouldn't last. But if someone gave me a big push off of a tall hill, then I might just be able to use the momentum to carry me there. Well, that's an awfully risky plan, said Ryan nervously. Yeah, you're right, admitted Duck. I know it's a silly idea, but I can't be stuck in the yard with these two buffoons any longer. Would you be willing to give me a shove off of the Natford Viaduct? I'll try and coast with my damaged wheel the rest of the way. Sure thing, said Ryan, but here, take my train. If Sir Topham Hatt catches you out on the main line without some cars, he's going to be highly suspicious. Excellent, said Duck. There's not a moment to lose if I want to get there before the day is over. Soon, after a lot of hard puffing and pulling, Duck was at the top of the Natford Viaduct with the baggage cars behind him. Ryan was in position, ready for Duck's signal. All right, said Duck. Once the turntable at the search and rescue center turns in my direction, then we're good to go. A few moments later, the turntable was moved into position. Now's our chance, shouted Duck. Give me a push. Ryan blew his whistle and raced forward into the back of Duck's train, which sent him flying down the track and across the turntable. But the car's momentum was much stronger than he had anticipated, and Duck struggled to regain control of the train. No, I missed the turn, he shouted. He ended up overturning into Farmer McColl's duck pond not far from where he had originally started. Quack! Quack, came a voice. Duck looked over and spotted Dilly, the duck that had entertained Donald and the passengers at Haltraw Station many years ago. Oh, hello, he said quietly. Um, this is a bit awkward, but I seem to have invaded your pond. I'm quite sorry. Quack, quack, replied Dilly. Duck rolled his eyes and smiled. We ducks never listen to anyone besides ourselves, do we, Dilly? Eventually, Harvey brought Rocky along with Sir Topham Hatt to the crash site. Ooh, I've always wanted to go fishing, said Rocky cheekily. Do you think I'll catch something today? I think your odds are pretty good, chuckled Harvey. Sir Topham Hatt, of course, was not amused, and he brought some workmen to the sheds that night to fix Duck before he managed to damage himself any more. And while his cracked wheel no longer made him waddle, the story was far from over. Look, children, said Thomas to a school trip. This engine is named Duck, and yesterday he ruffled some feathers and actually decided to go swimming with the ducks. What do we say to our friend Duck? Quack! 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 shouted the children. And as Thomas puffed away with his coaches, Duck couldn't help but quack a smile in return. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 182, It's Good to Be Bell. The Sodor Search and Rescue Center had recently welcomed two new engines to its fleet. Their names were Bell and Flynn, and both were eager to please their new controller, Sir Topham Hatt. Welcome to the Sodor Search and Rescue Center team, he boomed one morning. 
I trust that you both aspire to be really useful engines. Is that correct? Yes, sir, confirmed Bell and Flynn at the same time. Sir Topham Hatt smiled. Excellent, he said proudly. I will be giving you both a trial for the next week or two to see how you fit in here with the search and rescue team. As of right now, I only have the need for one fire engine, but if you both impress me, I have no quarrels about keeping you both. Good luck. Sir Topham Hatt walked away and Bell and Flynn looked anxiously around. So this is the search and rescue center, gasped Flynn. It's even bigger than I imagined, said Bell. Welcome to the team, shouted Captain. The Sodor Search and Rescue Center is a wonderful place to work. Indeed, agreed Butch. We're all one big family here, and we're eager to see what you two will add to the team. Don't worry, chuckled Flynn. I was born to fight fires. I'll show you all. You'll see. Well, actually, said Harold, being a part of the search and rescue team is not just about fighting fires. Granted, it gets really hot in the summer right now, and fires do happen, but we're also on call if anyone needs help regardless of the reason. Belle couldn't help but smile. This sounds like a fun place to work, she said. Yeah, agreed Flynn. Let's go fight some fires. And he raced away. Okay, chuckled Captain. Somebody's eager to get started. For the rest of the day, Butch led the two new engines around the island to show them about. They ended their tour at the docks that evening. So that's the entire island of Sodor, concluded Butch. Now that you know where everything is, we can get started with the fun stuff tomorrow. Belle and Flynn were overjoyed at the prospect of helping out wherever they were needed. The next day, the engines were ready to begin their training. First things first, said Rocky. It doesn't matter who gets to go to the rescue. It just matters that we get there as fast as we can and do the best we can. Suddenly, the alarm sounded from the fire station. It appears there's a small fire at the Sodor Sweet Shop, shouted Harold. Who wants to go with me? I do, I do, exclaimed Flynn, and he sped away before anyone could actually reply. Okay, said Harold, I guess it's Flynn and me at the Sodor Sweet Shop. Don't worry, Belle, I'm sure something will come up soon. All right, sounds good, smiled Belle. She was very eager for her first rescue. Slowly but surely, the day passed and Belle still hadn't moved. Flynn was running all over Sodor on roads and rails and was saving the day everywhere he went. Bell was beginning to feel quite useless. Here's a call, shouted Butch. There's something going on at the scrapyard. You want to take this one, Bell? At last, I get to do some work, she exclaimed, and quickly hurried away. But when Belle arrived at the scrapyard, she realized that the emergency wasn't as important as she originally thought. What seems to be the problem? she asked around. Well, said Reg, I think my crane arm is a little loose. I'm concerned that I'll lift up a heavy piece of scrap metal and it's going to break. Belle was confused on what to do. Okay, she murmured. So, do you want me to spray some water on it? No, that will make it rust, complained Reg. Um, how about I move these cars out of the way in case something bad happens? No, I need these to stay here. Edward is going to take them away soon. Uh, how about I... set everything on fire and then hose it down? What are you even talking about? asked Reg. Sorry, said Bell. I'm a fire engine. There's not a whole lot I can do beyond that. Oh, well, thanks for your help anyway, said Reg. I think I can manage. Bell took a deep breath and sighed. It had turned out to be a lousy day. I guess I'll go back to work, said Reg. Whoa, whoa, oh, I knew this was going to happen. Bell, Bell... I actually need some help now. But Belle had already puffed away. That night, everyone at the search and rescue center had gathered around to hear about Flynn's exciting day. 
And as soon as I get done helping rescue the kitten out of Henry's wishing tree, he continued, I get a call that the elephant at the animal park needs to be hosed down due to the heat. So what do I do? I hop off the rails and take the quickest road there. And not a moment too soon. That elephant would have been in trouble if I hadn't arrived that quickly. And then all of the people on the train started taking pictures of me, and there was no way I was going to leave in the middle of all that. While Flynn went on and on about his exciting day, Belle was left feeling slightly bitter. She had gotten all of the boring jobs while Flynn was on his way to becoming the star of the railway. Maybe there isn't a need for me to be here, she thought to herself. Sir Topham Hatt said he only needed one fire engine, and Flynn is clearly better than I am. It looks like I'll be regulated to scrapyard assistant if I'm lucky. The next day, Flynn was rearing and ready to go as soon as the first call came in. Flynn, I appreciate your enthusiasm, said Captain, but I want to see what Bell can do in an emergency situation this time. You want to take this one, Bell? But Bell was feeling depressed. No thanks, she murmured. I'm not feeling well. No worries, Belle, said Flynn. I'll do enough work for the both of us. I'm off to save the day. And Flynn raced away as fast as he could. Everyone was very surprised that Belle turned down the offer, but she was in no mood to explain why. Just then, another call came in with an emergency at the docks. That's strange, said Butch. Flynn was just on his way to the docks. Something pretty serious must be going on there. Bell, we really need your help, urged Rocky. Will you go see what the matter is? Bell noticed that her new friends really cared about her. I suppose I could, she said, smiling. Excellent, said Harold, and it will be my pleasure to escort you there. With his propellers buzzing and her fire burning bright, Harold and Belle raced to the docks. When they arrived, they were shocked at the mess. Cranky had accidentally dropped a package full of dynamite onto the ground, and Flynn had come in too hot on the road and overshot the track, knocking down some coal and fuel cars in the process. Clear the area, shouted the dockmaster. This is a catastrophe waiting to happen. Telephone the main line, said Arthur. Let them know that the docks will be permanently closed until further notice. This is going to cause a significant amount of confusion and delay, said Salty sadly. Don't worry, said Bell. Let me see if I can help. Very carefully, she shunted the remaining cars away from the crash site and applied her brakes slowly, determined not to let any potential sparks jumpstart the blaze. Then she zoomed forward and kicked the package of dynamite into the ocean. It had been risky, but the fiery crisis was averted. Well done, Belle, shouted Cranky. You handled that flawlessly. It looked pretty amazing from the sky, agreed Harold. You have a talent for this sort of thing. Even Flynn, who was embarrassed at having messed up, congratulated his teammate. Job well done, he said smiling. I think we'll make a great team, don't you think? Agreed, said Bell. There's no way Sir Topham Hatt can separate us now. You may be Fiery Flynn, but it's certainly good to be Bell, don't you think? And the rest of the engines at the docks had to agree. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 183 Victor's Locomotives After being rescued from the other railway by Oliver, Victor the narrow gauge engine had finally found his calling at the Sodor Steamworks. In no time, he had been put in charge of all of the projects and restorations that needed to be completed, but there was still one engine that he kept overlooking. Victor's looking a bit shabby, said Percy quietly to a new crane. As the face of the steamworks, he should be one of, if not the, best kept engine on the island. I agree, said Kevin, but Victor's so focused on his work that he hasn't had any time for himself. He needs one of those makeovers he gives all of the other engines, agreed Percy. You should talk to him about it. 
Plus, the smell of that old seawater on his paint is terrible. But Kevin was nervous. He had only just arrived at the steamworks and didn't want to tell his boss what to do. He tried mentioning it to him one night, but Victor wasn't having it. There are no breaks at the steamworks, he insisted. A day off means that all of the other engines will suffer without repairs. While I go and treat myself to a luxury they themselves are waiting for. I can't afford to lose such valuable time anyway. Kevin was rather distraught that Victor hadn't taken his advice. The next day, the steamworks was crowded with engines big and small, and everyone was very busy. My boiler is aching, complained Rosie. I understand. Have you tried some coal from a different hopper? asked Victor. No, but what I'd really like is a boiler flush, she admitted. Uh, that's not really my department, insisted Victor. Ah, Ben, what brings you here? I'm still waiting on my new paint, reminded Ben. I can't be stuck like this blue clown forever, you know. Uh, yes, uh, go sit over there. I'll be with you in a moment. Ben puffed over and saw Stephen hanging from the rafters. Stephen, what are you still doing here? he asked. Just waiting on my restoration, he replied indifferently. This is the corner where Victor sends you if he doesn't have any time for you. Prepare for a good wait. Oh, bother, groaned Ben. Just then, Scarloe puffed it. Victor, there's been a collision at the incline between Peter, Sam, and Freddy. Both of them are fine, but they need repairs immediately. Tell them they'll have to wait in line like everybody else, he insisted. Kevin, where's my toolbox? Coming, boss, he shouted from afar. The problem is, continued Scarloe, there are some trucks that are jammed between them. They can't move until the repairs are done. What? So you're saying I have to go to them? Victor asked in disbelief. That's not how the steamworks operates. Then what's this car over here for? quizzed Scarloe. That's for mobile repairs. Oh, fine, I'll go. Kevin, I'll be back in a bit. Please don't let everything go haywire while I'm gone. Yes, Victor, he shouted as he came to a crashing stop. Uh, have any of you seen Victor's toolbox? Victor soon left with Scarloe and Kevin was put in charge of the works. He honestly had no idea what to do. Uh, hi Ben, he said nervously. What seems to be the problem? I'm waiting on some yellow paint to replace this dreadful blue undercoat, he said. But Victor's been too busy lately, so I guess I'll go another day without it. Oh, nonsense, smiled Kevin. I'll send an engine to the paint factory to pick it up for you. That way, we can put it on you as soon as they get back. Oh, that would be excellent, said Ben. Hmm, now which engine should I send, pondered Kevin. Uh, how about you there, Rosie? She's really in no condition to go anywhere, said the workman. Oh, pish posh, she's not Henry, laughed Kevin. I'm sure that boiler ache will go away with a nice run to the paint factory for Ben here. But that's all the way on the other side of the island gasped Rosie. Time's a tickin', shouted Kevin. Let's make Victor proud so that when he comes back from his little trip, he'll realize what a splendid crane, I, I mean, uh, what really useful engines and workmen you all are. The rest of the engines were skeptical, but Kevin was in charge now. He was quite enjoying the opportunity, and it was fun telling all of the engines what to do. But his hubris soon got the best of him when Victor returned later that day. Kevin, what's happened here? He shouted. The steamworks is a mess. And why is Rosie missing? I told her to stay put. I sent her to go pick up Ben's yellow paint, said Kevin smartly. Although she should be back by now. Victor weeshed crossly. No, Kevin. The reason Ben doesn't have a new coat of paint yet is because the paint factory is having a recall. I didn't want to tell him that because I figured it would make him upset. So I've been trying to break the news to him gently. 
Aww, groaned Ben sadly. I'm never going to get a new coat of paint. Join the club, muttered Stephen. Just then a workman walked over. We've just received word that Rosie crashed on her way back from the paint factory. She wasn't feeling well and accidentally drifted onto Thomas's branch line, where she... Victor! came a loud voice. In puffed Thomas the tank engine, covered in a rainbow of paint colors from smoke box to cab. What happened? cried Kevin. Rosie crashed into me at Ellsbridge Station, he complained. You sent her on her way when she clearly wasn't feeling well. And look what happened. I'm a complete mess. Good thing he doesn't know about the paint recall, chuckled Kevin. But Victor and Thomas glared at the new crane. That's enough, shouted Victor. You are all driving me loco. Crazy, that is. I can't work with this much confusion and delay surrounding me. Kevin felt terrible. He had tried his best to fill Victor's spot, but had only made a mess of everything. I'm sorry, everyone, said Kevin sadly. It's all my fault. Oh, come on, Victor, said Stephen. Give the crane a break, will you? He's just starting out, and you left him in charge of an awful lot of things. Victor realized that Stephen was right. He took a deep breath and sighed. I'm sorry, Kevin for placing the blame on you when it was my fault all along. In fact, the Steamworks would be in much more chaos right now if you weren't here at all. I should be thanking you, not scolding you. And I'm sorry too, added Kevin. Who am I to try and pretend to be the best engine to ever run the Steamworks? I hate to break up this nice moment, but what about the rest of us? asked Thomas. Victor, can you get this paint off of me or what? Yes, right away, replied Victor. Although, if Rosie went to go pick up Ben's yellow paint, why are you covered in all sorts of different colors? I actually requested that Rosie bring you some red paint for a possible makeover, said Kevin shyly, and I thought green would go well on Stephen over there. Absolutely not, shouted Stephen certainly. Well, that settles that, chuckled Victor. That was awfully nice of you, Kevin. And as a thank you for all of your hard work, I suppose a new coat of paint wouldn't be so bad. It's your only option, said the workman. All of that slime and algae from the ocean would be impossible to get off without completely removing everything. And with the recall on yellow paint from the factory, said Thomas, it looks like red is your only option. Or green, chuckled Kevin. No, red is just fine, said Victor. Once I'm done with today's duties, I'll treat myself, just like you said I should. And the next morning, when Kevin arrived at the steamworks, Victor's new coat of paint sparkled brilliantly in the sunshine. Kevin was very impressed. Great choice, said Victor. It's nice to change things up once in a while. Just then, James puffed in. Victor, I was helping clean up Rosie's mess yesterday, and some paint... Hey, Victor? Victor? Hmm, I wonder where he's gone off to. And James puffed away. Victor and Kevin looked at each other and smiled cheekily. It was certainly good to be friends again. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends Wooden Railway Adventures Episode 184 Bert's Arsdale Fail A new little railway had just opened up on Duck's branch line, and although it wasn't very big, it featured some unique engines. Their names were Mike, Bert, and Frank, and all three were very proud to be the inaugural workers on the Arsdale Railway. One morning, as Oliver was preparing to leave Knapford Station, Gordon spoke up. Dear me, Oliver, those trucks look awfully heavy for such a small engine like you. Why don't you let me take your train instead, and you can run off and have a nice free day to yourself? Oliver laughed. What's the matter with you, Gordon? he asked. You've never wanted to take my trucks before. There's a first time for everything, I suppose. Besides, Henry's taking the express and I've nothing to do. 
On second thought, maybe I should stay here in case somebody needs to be rescued later today. I'm not going to crash, snorted Henry. And the only reason you want to take Oliver's trucks is so that you can see the little engines on his branch line. Oh, certainly not, protested Gordon. A dignified engine like me has no time for the likes of Mike, Frank, and Bert. Hmm, chuckled Toby. You seem to know quite a bit about these small engines, considering you're not interested. Gordon spluttered. Oh, is that their names? He inquired innocently. Lucky guess, I suppose. Oliver realized what was going on. No, Gordon, you can't take my train to go look at the small engines. But nice try, though. Oliver blew his whistle and puffed cheerfully away. The rest of the engines looked awkwardly at Gordon. What? It was worth a shot, he protested. And Gordon certainly wasn't the only one interested in the small engines. The pack just so happened to, conveniently, start on a new project next to the railway when word got out. Oh, they're so tiny, shrieked Isabella. Do you think anyone would notice if I stuck one on my flatbed and took it home? Yes, I'm positive somebody would have a fuss about that, said Byron flatly. Oh, look, here comes one, said Alfie. Pretend that we're working, everyone. Yes, look safe to me, shouted Nelson. I concur, agreed Patrick. Top-notch build for sure. Excellent craftsmanship, murmured Kelly. You know, said Mike, if you just want to watch us work, we're fine with that. No, we're not, shouted Frank crossly. Get your shovels and flatbeds out of here before I jump off the rails and scare you hooligans away. Uh, just ignore him, said Mike quietly. Frank is always grumpy. I'm not grumpy, he retorted. Everybody else is just too happy. Hey, Bert, get over here and finish your work. But Bert was talking to a man at the new dynamite stand. Hi there, he said quietly. My name's Bert. Welcome to our little railway. Pleasure to meet you, Bert, said the gentleman. My name's John, Sailor John. I run this dynamite stand, and I look forward to seeing you little folks every day. Bert smiled. Well, I better get back to work. It was very nice to meet you. Bert puffed back to the turntable to spin around. Frank, meanwhile, wasn't so convinced at the gentleman's presence. The next day, he rolled over to where Sailor John was setting up shop. This is an awfully big stand for such a tiny amount of dynamite, commented Frank. In fact, by the looks of it, I can't see any dynamite anywhere. That's because a clumsy crane at the docks dropped it all and it fell into the sea, replied Sailor John. You know how it is. Us old timers against the world, huh? Frank was very surprised. At last, he grumbled, somebody who understands me. And he and Sailor John spent quite a lot of time talking about the young'uns and how useless they were. Meanwhile, Mike and Bert spent their free time talking with the bigger engines. It's amazing how small ye are, said Donald. You're tiny enough so that your railway doesn't take up too much space. But you still get the job done, finished Douglas. Mike and Bert quickly became conceited. Nobody cared about us this much on our other line, said Mike. Think we should show these bigger engines what we can do? Normally I would object to such silly behavior, said Bert. But come on, we won't be the talk of the railway forever, you know. A few days later, a shipment of ballast came down from the mines and Mike and Bert teamed up to bring it to the junction. Things were running smoothly until they stopped on a bridge. Look, said Mike, the big engines have gathered to watch us make our grand entrance. But Bert was looking somewhere else. He spotted Sailor John talking to some unfamiliar lorries by the dynamite stand. Hey, Mike, he began. I think there's something going on. Let's keep moving, shouted Mike. I don't want to be late. No, replied Bert. What are they doing? Go? Okay, shouted Mike, and he pushed the train forward. 
Bert was left without much choice as he rocketed onto the turntable and up the incline. With Mike pushing from behind, he leaped over the buffers and was left dangling from above. The big engines were taken quite by surprise. Now this was worth the trip over here, chuckled Gordon. Hang in there, laughed Duck. Help is on the way, I'm sure of it. It's hard to overlook a little engine when they're hanging right in front of you, said Whiff. Bert was very embarrassed, and no matter how hard Mike tried, he couldn't manage to pull him back onto the rails. When Frank found out about the mess, he was very upset. You hoodlums, he shouted. Are you trying to make me blow a fuse with all this trouble? Because if you are, you're succeeding. Just then, Sir Topham had arrived. Oh dear, he said quietly. I came over here to check out this new dynamite stand that everyone is talking about. But it appears I've stumbled upon something else instead. Sorry, sir, said Bert sadly. Sailor John overheard what Sir Topham Hatt was saying and quickly walked over. Howdy, folks. Sailor John here. I know most of you are too busy being really useful engines, but if you're ever in the need for some dynamite, don't be afraid to stop by. Turns out I've got some fine lorries here to help me with my business. The engines gassed as the three lorries roared up next to Sailor John. What are they doing here? gasped Duck. Yeah, where have the rest of you been all this time? asked Gordon. Sailor John, with all due respect, you can't trust these lorries, said Sir Topham Hatt. They've plotted to remove my engines from service for years. But Sailor John knew what was coming. I've set up shop here, and I don't intend on moving, he replied firmly. So deal with it, or I'll deal with you. I've got a very short fuse, so to speak. And Sailor John walked away. Sir Topham Hatt and the engines looked at each other. This Sailor John fellow had only just introduced himself, but he seemed like a troublesome one that was bound to stick around for a while. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 185, The Duke of Hazard. One morning on the Scarloe Railway, Bertram stopped at Boulder Mountain on his way to work at the incline. Good morning, Bertram, said Thumper cheerfully. Hi, Thumper, he replied. Any drilling here at the construction site today? I'm afraid not. Apparently, the small railway on Duck's branch line is going to start supplying most of the island's quarry needs, so I wouldn't be surprised if this site eventually closes down. Well, it's probably for the best, agreed Bertram. It's always been a dangerous job trying to drill around bull- Ow! That hurt! What happened? asked Thumper. I think some rocks just hit me in the head. Oh, there they are again! What's going on? That's not normal, said Thumper. I think something's happening to the mountain. But before Thumper had even finished, the foundation of the construction site began to shake violently. The workman's house on the side of the track tipped over and collapsed right in front of Bertram's path. Let's get out of here, shouted Thumper. I can't go anywhere, protested Bertram. Then, all of a sudden, Boulder leaped from his perch and smashed hard into Bertram's cab. When the smoke cleared, the rock slide had stopped. Bertram? Bertram, shouted Thumper. Are you all right? but there was no reply from underneath the mountain of dirt and rubble. After several hours of digging, the workmen were finally able to remove Bertram, and Madge quickly rushed him off to the works. The narrow-gauge engines were in shock. He's pretty beat up, said Reneus quietly. I watched the whole thing unfold at Ulfstead Station, and I felt so helpless knowing there was nothing I could do. It just goes to show you how dangerous the work up here in the hills really is, said Freddy. Let's keep the track clear, said Sir Topham Hatt. We need to get all of this hazardous rubble off the line so that the trains can continue as scheduled. He turned to one of the workmen. Get an engine from the yard to bring a breakdown crane, he said swiftly. Preferably a younger, youthful one. 
but the only engine available was Duke. He was resting peacefully in his shed when his driver woke him. Come on, old boy, he said. We got ourselves a job to do. Huh, grunted Duke. I knew the moment I closed my eyes somebody was going to walk up and disturb the peace. And don't call me old boy, you old boy. Duke quickly found the crane and made his way over the bridge to the construction site. By then, the majority of the engines had cleared out, with the exception of Reneus' train. There's still a high possibility of falling rock, said Sir Topham Hatt, so I want you to go exchange these open coaches for some covered ones. I don't want any passengers getting bonked on the head in case there's another rock slide. Yes, sir, said Reneus quickly. Come along, girls. Looks like our journey is being cut short today. Oh, it's not fair, complained Ada. But it's such a nice day out, argued Jane. Eh, I could use a day off, said Mabel indifferently. The passengers were now stuck at Ulfstead Station until some new coaches could be found. Duke had puffed up to see if there was anything he could do to help. I'm glad those days of hard labor are behind me, he told his driver. I couldn't compete in today's world. I mean, look at this magnificent engine. Streamlined and everything. Hey, I know who you are, said Connor. You're Duke, named after his grace himself. Duke was very flattered. And they know their history, too. At last, Reneus arrived with the covered coaches. Due to the delay in trains, there were many more passengers than anticipated, and Reneus could feel the weight adding up as everyone climbed aboard. I don't know if I can do this, he admitted. These coaches seem very heavy already. Duke will have to help then, said Sir Topham Hatt. I want to get these passengers back to the station as soon as possible. They have had a long day, and so have I. Just then, Caroline the car pulled up. I'll meet you at Croven's Gate so I can be there to welcome the passengers when they arrive, said Sir Topham Hatt, and he climbed aboard and Caroline drove away. Let's avoid the construction site and instead get some speed through Ulfstead Castle, said Duke, to make sure we clear that pesky bridge before the animal park, and he ran around to the back of the train to help push. Slowly but surely, the two engines managed to move the heavy coaches out of the station. Meanwhile, the pack had been called in to repair the fallen house and check on the integrity of the rest of the mountain. They were crossing under the bridge when Reneus and Duke rounded the corner. Kelly had forgotten to lower his crane from a previous project and accidentally began to remove the top of the bridge. Don't stop, shouted Reneus. We'll never be able to regain our speed. Kelly had realized what he was doing just in time and stopped immediately. Reneus and the coaches managed to clear the bridge right before it collapsed on top of Max and Monty. The two dump trucks were very upset at the situation. Oh, bother, snorted Duke. He hadn't been able to keep up with Reneus's quick pace, and he was now stranded on the other side. Looks like you're going to be stuck here for a while, said Thumper quietly. But Duke was more determined than ever. No, he said firmly. Today's been an awful day. I was awoken from my nap, have had to push a heavy train full of cranky passengers, and now the only thing that's separating me from my warm cozy shed is this pathetic bridge. Well, you know what? I'm not sleeping outside tonight and with a mighty heave, Duke began to move forward, but he was headed towards Boulder Mountain. Uh, Duke, where are you going? asked Thumper. I'll be back. You wait and see, he shouted. The pack and Thumper sat awkwardly in silence as they waited for Duke to reappear again. So, said Alfie quietly, any new updates on Bertram? Yeah, he's going to need a new cab and a new boiler and everything, said Nelson. He'll look like a completely different engine, said Isabella. Here I come, shouted Duke. Racing as fast as he could, Duke zoomed up the hill and promptly fell face first into the dirt. Oh, Duke, said Alfie, did you really think that was going to work? No, not really, he admitted. 
I guess the lesson learned here is that an engine can't jump a bridge even if he really puts his mind to it. That was entertaining though, smiled Thumper. But the landing was a bit off, said Jack. That would have never suited his grace, you know. Yes, let's be thankful he didn't see that, chuckled Duke. The next day, after being sent to the works for some minor repairs, Duke was finally able to return to the comfort of his own shed. But the peace and quiet didn't last long. I heard about your failed attempt to jump the bridge, said Peter Sam. How did that go, Grandpuff? How do you think it went, you impertinent scallywag, seethed Duke. Go and bug somebody else, will you? Peter Sam laughed and puffed away. Duke was finally able to close his eyes and rest. It's a big scary world out there, he said to himself. I think it's better if I just stay in my shed here. And with that, Duke closed his eyes and promptly fell asleep. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 186, Rust or Bust. Stephen had been stuck at the steamworks for some time and there was no end in sight. He desperately wanted to rejoin his friends on the rails, but was still waiting on a new coat of paint. It didn't take long for Stephen to begin feeling a bit frustrated. Let me down from here, he cried. It's about time I was fixed and sent on my way. Don't you agree, Victor? Of course I do, he replied. But you're not going anywhere until you get a fresh coat of paint. But how much longer do I have to wait, asked Stephen. I've been stuck up here for months. I'm like the Sydney of the Steamworks over here. I told you, when the recall at the paint factory ends, then we'll get you down from there. In the meantime, you're in no shape to go running around Sodor. You'll fall to pieces as soon as you get over that bridge over there. Stephen knew that Victor was right, but he was too impatient to sit still any longer. I guess I'll have to go find some paint myself, he said boldly, and began to spin his wheels in anticipation. Whoa, don't do that, said Hero. Listen, I'll go to the paint factory myself and see if anything's changed. If that will keep you from jumping off the rafters, then I'll be happy to do it. Oh, you're so kind, Hero, said Stephen happily. Thanks for helping out a friend. No problem at all, replied Hero. I know what it's like to have to wait for new parts. It can get very boring. I'll see if there's anything I can do. Hero puffed away and eventually found himself at the paint factory near Edward's branch line. A worker was taking his lunch break outside. Hi there, I have a friend at the steamworks who desperately needs a new coat of paint. I know there's a recall going on right now, but if you had just one can of paint, any color at all, I'm sure he would be very happy. Hmm said the workman. Let me see what I can do. While the workman walked back inside, Bill puffed up. Oh, hello, hero, he said. What are you doing here? I'm trying to pick up some paint for Stephen, he replied. He's getting a little frustrated about his makeover, and I'm hoping this will make things right. Well, that's a good idea, said Bill. In fact, Ben's still waiting for a new coat of paint as well. I wonder if your friend could help me too. Just then, the workman walked back outside. I just checked the records, and the only barrel of untainted paint that we have is this one right here. But fair warning, it's yellow. Oh, that's perfect, exclaimed Hero. I'm sure Stephen wouldn't mind being painted such a bright color. Then everyone can see him coming from miles away. I'll take it. Me as well, said Bill. Oh boy, Ben's going to be thrilled when he learns about this. Actually, this is the only barrel I have, said the workman, and I promised it to Hero. Sorry, Bill. Hero puffed away with the paint, and Bill was left feeling rather sad. Oh, this would have made Ben's day for sure, he said glumly. I guess I'll have to figure something else out. And I may just have a cheeky idea. And Bill puffed quickly away. Later that day, Hero was sitting at a signal next to Spencer and Murdoch. 
He was telling them about Stephen's makeover when Bill puffed quietly up. Oh, he's going to look magnificent, boasted Hero. The best engine on the railway for sure. Behind me, of course, said Spencer snootily. Yes, right, agreed Murdoch. But you know, Hero, Sir Topham Hatt never officially held an opening celebration for Ulfstead Castle. You should tell him about Stephen's repairs and see if he'll host something like that. That's a great idea, said Hero. Let me drop this paint off and I'll go do it right away. But as Hero puffed away, he didn't realize that Bill had stolen his precious paint. I'm sure Stephen will get repainted soon enough, he said whimsically. But in the meantime, Ben will be so thrilled when he sees this. Back at the steamworks, Stephen had heard about the news and was very giddy about his impending makeover. You don't know how excited I am, he told Kevin. I've been waiting for this for years. It's about time the rocket had some upgrades, don't you think? Oh, here comes Hero now. Hey, where's the paint? asked Kevin. What do you mean? asked Hero. It's right here. Right where? asked Stephen. Goodness me! shouted Hero. The paint, it's, it's disappeared. I had it just a moment ago at the signal. Ugh! groaned Stephen. What did I do to deserve all this? Don't worry, said Hero. I'll make it my life's work to find out where that barrel of paint went. You should retrace your steps, said Kevin. That's what I do when I forget something. Like this. And he backed up right into a mountain of packages. Kevin, what's going on over there? Came Victor's voice. Uh-oh, said Kevin nervously. I was never here. Bye. Hero rolled his eyes and puffed out of the steamworks. Meanwhile, word had spread about Stephen's refurbishment and soon everybody on Sodor knew what was going on. Hey, Bill, said Boko, have you heard what's going to happen to Stephen? Murdoch told me earlier that Hero found the last barrel of untainted paint on the island, and he's going to give it to Stephen. Ha, huh, yeah, okay then, said Bill. Good luck with that plan. Hey, Ben, I have a special surprise for you. Oh, really? squeaked Ben. What is it? It's the last barrel of yellow paint on the island, said Bill coolly. I know that because I stole it from Hero at the junction. You did what? asked Boko. I mean, uh, I found it. I found it at the junction, right after Hero left. I didn't see Hero. He didn't see me. Why do you ask? Is that yellow paint? asked Ben. Oh, finally! I can return to my normal colors at last. But Boko was very cross. Bill, did you take this paint from Hero? And was it meant for Stephen instead of Ben? Uh, maybe? Oh dear, this won't do, said Ben quickly. We must return this paint to Stephen. Whoa, are you sure? asked Boko. Yeah, what about your repaint? said Bill. I can wait, said Ben simply. Stephen is a magnificent engine. He's a far more important locomotive than I can ever hope to be. Thanks for offering, Bill, but this paint belongs to him. Well, I am impressed, said Boko. That was very mature of you, Ben, and I'm sure Stephen will be very pleased when he hears the news. And pleased was an understatement. Stephen was ecstatic when Hero returned with his yellow paint, and Victor and Kevin quickly got to work. That weekend, Sir Topham had officially opened Ulfstead Castle in a magnificent celebration, and the freshly repainted Stephen was the first engine to take the passengers on a tour. You look marvelous, Stephen, shouted Hero. All thanks to you, my friend, and thanks for the paint, Bill and Ben. You sure do know how to treat a nice old engine like me. Just then, Sir Topham Hatt spoke up. May I formally reintroduce one of the most famous engines to ever run the rails of Sodor. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, may I present to you, Stephen, the Rocket. And the crowd erupted into cheers as Stephen puffed out of the station with pride, very happy to have been returned to his former glory. 
Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 187, Go Boldly, Coldy. One morning, Thomas and his coaches were on their way to Maithwaite Station when he saw a very unusual engine outside of the steamworks. Annie, Clarabelle, look, he said quietly. Have you ever seen anything like that before? It appears to be a mountain engine, said Clarabelle happily. You should go talk to him, Thomas. Oh, yes, indeed, said Annie. What, me, spluttered Thomas. What am I going to say? Oh, I don't know. Hey, you, over there. Nice railway you got here. Annie, what are you doing, asked Thomas. You're embarrassing me. The engine looked over at Thomas. Why, hello there, he said cheerfully, and welcome to the Coldy Fell Railway. Hi there, said Thomas shyly. What a lovely station you have here. I'm Thomas and these are my coaches, Annie and Clarabelle. Pleased to meet you all, said the engine happily. My name is Coldy, obviously. Obviously, asked Thomas curiously. Oh, where are my manners? I'm named after the railway, of course. Wow, said Annie, that's most impressive. Too bad you're not named after your railway, Thomas, said Clarabelle cheekily. Oh, quiet down back there, said Thomas defensively. Anyway, we must be going. Oh, don't leave quite yet, shouted Coldy eagerly. I'm sorry, I haven't talked to anyone new in a while. I just arrived here on Sodor and you're the first big engine I've met. Where are all the rest of your friends? asked Thomas. Surely it can't just be you here. But it is, smiled Coldy. We've all been away overseas for repairs, and I'll be the only one running the line for the meantime. Ahem, came a voice. Don't forget about me. Oh, of course. My apologies, dear. That's Catherine, everyone, and she's my coach. The two of us have to climb the line tomorrow to deliver some supplies before winter sets in, so I best be going. But it was very nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you too, Coldy, said Thomas. He seems like a nice engine. A very dashing engine indeed, said Clarabelle. Oh, what I wouldn't give to go sightseeing with that fellow. Annie, shouted Thomas, that's enough. I think it's time we got going again. That night, Catherine and Coldy were in their sheds, resting up for their impending journey. Coldy was a bit nervous, however. I'm not quite sure about our trip tomorrow, he said to Catherine. It's going to be a dangerous one, and I haven't climbed hills this steep in years. Relax, Coldy, she said calmly. It will be a piece of cake. You focus on pushing the train up the hill, and I'll keep a sharp lookout like I always do. But this is a very important delivery, said Coldy. The supplies we're taking will be used to build the roof for the summit station. If we don't deliver the pieces in time, then the project will have to be completed next spring, and our opening day could be delayed. You needn't worry about a thing, smiled Catherine. We'll leave Brighton early so that we can get up and down the mountain as soon as possible. You're right, said Coldy firmly. There's nothing to worry about. We'll conquer Coldy Fell with the swift turn of a side rod. The next morning, Coldy and Catherine were preparing to leave the station when they saw Sir Topham Hatt walk up. Sir, what are you doing here? asked Catherine. I wanted to wish you both good luck on your expedition today, he said. Hopefully you'll be up and down the mountain before tea time. That's the plan, sir, said Coldy cheerfully. Excellent, said Sir Topham Hatt. Now, if you don't mind, I'm off to bed again. It's way too early to be up at this kind of hour. Coldy and Catherine chuckled. The sun was just starting to peek over Gordon's Hill in the distance when the guard's whistle blew. Go boldly, Coldy, said Sir Topham Hatt, and have a wonderful trip. Yes, sir, shouted Coldy. Off we go! And he steamed quickly out of the station. The track ran flat for a while, and he and Catherine sped down the line as fast as he could, which wasn't particularly fast. 
Soon, however, the track began to grow steeper as they began their rigorous ascent. Take your time, Coldy, shouted Catherine. Don't run out of puff too early. The track's clear as far as I can see. Coldy went slowly up the mountain, but it was still hard work. His cheeks quickly turned as red as his fire. It had been a while since he had climbed something this steep. Smooth and steady, smooth and steady, repeated Catherine. Good job, Coldy. You're almost at the top. And the two came to a quick stop. Catch your breath, said Catherine. How are you feeling? Old and out of shape, chuckled Coldy. The supplies in this truck are surprisingly heavy. Just then, the track began to quiver beneath them. Coldy spotted some rocks falling into the abyss below. Let's get going, said Catherine. We'll have to tell the workmen that this section of the line needs some repairs this winter. And the two bounced over the false summit and in no time were passing by the station where the workmen were waiting. Well done, Coldy, shouted Catherine. Nearly there. Then there was trouble. The ground underneath the track suddenly gave away and Catherine was left dangling off the side of the mountain. Ah! she screamed go back go back the workmen quickly ran over and jumped inside the open car we can finish the roof in the spring one of them shouted let's get off this summit before all of the track falls apart with all of his might coldy pulled Catherine back onto the rails just as the remainder of the track went flying off the edge of the mountain well that was a close one, said Coldy as he breathed a sigh of relief. Are you okay, Catherine? Yes, I'm fine, she managed to say. But let's get somewhere closer to the actual ground, shall we? You don't have to ask me twice, agreed Coldy, and he chugged slowly away. Nobody talked much on the way down the mountain. It was very eerie when they passed the wreckage of track near Shiloh. At last, they arrived back at Kirk Mashin Station. Welcome back, everyone, shouted Sir Topham Hat. I've had a nap and I'm... Wait, I see that you still have the supplies, Coldy. What happened? The entire line came apart at the summit, said Catherine wearily. I just about pulled a godred, but Coldy was magnificent as always and hauled me to safety. Well, I'm certainly glad everyone's all right, said Sir Topham Hatt. We can finish the station in the spring when the snow melts. Safety always comes first on my railway. Speaking of which, I must be off. There's been yet another accident near Tidmouth. Again. And Sir Topham Hatt walked away. You were marvelous, Coldy, said Catherine happily. Not really, he admitted. I almost let you fall off the side of the mountain, Catherine. I would have never forgiven myself if that had happened. Oh, please, save your speech for another time, she interrupted. You know very well that if I had fallen off the mountain, I was going to take you with me whether you liked it or not. Coldy chuckled. I suppose you're right, he said, smiling. Come on, then. Let's get started on the winter renovation, shall we? We seem to have a lot of areas in need of repairs. Hmm, now what would give you that kind of idea? Asked Catherine smugly. Very funny, replied Coldy. And the two friends puffed away, eager to get started on their very busy winter. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 188, Oliver's Fossil Fright. One day, Henry was on his way to Olfstead Castle when he saw Max and Monty by the side of the tracks. I wonder why this old mine is blocked off, questioned Max. Do you think there's something eerie inside? asked Monty. We should totally check it out, smiled Max. What are you two doing? asked Henry. There's a reason there's that sign in front of the entrance, to keep troublesome dump trucks like you out. Now be off before I tell Sir Topham Hatt what you're up to. Go back to your tunnel, Henry, laughed Monty. We're going to check it out, and Bert here is welcome to join us. Sweet, replied Bert. 
Just because Halloween's over doesn't mean we can't explore something spooky. Great, said Max. I'll break down the door. No, 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 shouted Henry. There's a reason the door is locked and nobody's been inside for a long time. It's best to just leave things the way they are. And Henry puffed away. What's gotten into old square wheels over there? laughed Bert. I knew steam engines were wimps. Let's break this thing open and see what's inside. Yeah, shouted Monty. But we're probably not going to get inside with ordinary equipment. We need something bigger, something much more powerful. And I know exactly what you're talking about, said Bert. You do? asked Monty. Great, let's go get it and the two raced away in opposite directions. Unfortunately, neither Bert nor Monty realized that they were thinking of two completely different things. Bert was the first to arrive at the Arsdale Railway. I guess I beat Monty here, he said to himself. Hey, you, up there, little engine, I need your help. Oh, I have a name, you know, said the engine crossly. Hey, Bert, said Mike as he puffed up. Yeah? yeah, the two engines responded at the same time. Wait, your name's Bert, too? What are you doing stealing my name, huh? Well, this is awkward. Bert, Sailor John's here to talk to you, said Mike again. That's just who I need to see, exclaimed Bert. No, not that Bert, insisted Mike. But it was too late. Sailor John soon arrived and Big Bert explained what was going on. A locked mine door, eh? Sounds like you're in need of some explosives, don't you think? Exactly. Would you mind bringing some dynamite so that we can bust open the door and find out what's inside? I suppose I could, replied Sailor John. I was going to look at this little dinghy I had my eye on, but this sounds way more exciting. Off we go! and Bert and Sailor John soon set off. Meanwhile, Monty had arrived at the docks where a new excavator was working. Where's Bert, he wondered. Oh, Oliver, there you are. We need your big demolition bucket to pry open a door to an abandoned mine. Ooh, that sounds fun, said Oliver. My first big job here on Sodor. I'll be happy to help once I'm done with Skiff's final touches. Grrr, growled Monty. All right, but get a move on it. Boy, he sure is a mean thing, said Skiff quietly. Yeah, you're right, agreed Oliver. I still don't know how that dump truck gets around Sodor so quickly. One minute I'll see him at Boulder Mountain, then I'll go to the incline, and he's already beaten me there. Crazy stuff, you know. Actually, said Skiff, I think there are two of them. He has a brother or something. Huh, yeah, right, chuckled Oliver. That's a good one. Well, anyway, Skiff, I'm glad I was able to put you on this old handcar chassis. You'll finally be able to cruise the rails of Sodor, just like you've always dreamed of. Thank you, Oliver, said Skiff kindly. Being a dinghy is fun and all, but I can't wait to give the children boat tours near Arsdale. There's even a nice old man that says he's interested in buying me. Well, good luck, chuckled Oliver, and he rolled away to join his friends at the mine. Meanwhile, Bert and Sailor John had returned and were setting up the dynamite near the tunnel entrance. Max had spread the word and the rest of the pack had arrived to witness the important event. Everybody stand back, shouted Sailor John. This is going to get loud and messy. He quickly lit the fuse and ran back behind the road vehicles. I think we may have used too much dynamite, said Alfie nervously. Boom! There was a massive explosion and rock went everywhere. When the dust cleared, the mine entrance was still standing, but it looked a little different. What is that? asked Byron. It's a dinosaur, exclaimed Nelson. Well, that was a bust, shouted Bert. I told you, we should have put the dynamite near the entrance. After all, that's the thing we want to blow up, isn't it? 
You watch your mouth, you scallywag, said Sailor John sternly. This be my dynamite, after all, and I'll choose where to put it. Now everybody get out of here. I'll come back some other day with more supplies and get the job done. The pack rolled away, feeling rather displeased with the outcome. Soon everyone had left. Sailor John smirked and turned around. Like I was going to bust open this mine in front of everyone, he chuckled. He gently kicked the door open with his foot and it swung back and forth. I didn't want to obliterate the door, he said to himself. Just enough of a boom to knock these bolts off. Just then, Oliver rolled up looking for his friends. Hello? Is anyone here? Monty, I am ready to knock down this door just like you asked. Shiver me timbers, whispered Sailor John. I need to get this excavator out of here. Hmm, said Oliver. Well, I guess I should get started so that when everyone arrives... Arr! came a scary voice. Who's there? gasped Oliver. It is I, the ghost of Captain Callus. Depart from this wretched mine at once, or you shall face the same fate of this here dinosaur. Just then, Oliver saw the fossil sticking out from the mine wall and screamed. Ah! he shouted and quickly backed away. Har, 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 chuckled Sailor John. Don't go looking for a treat in these parts of Sodor, because you'll never know what'll end up tricking you instead. Har, har, har! And Sailor John quietly stepped into the abandoned mine. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 189, Who Stole the Coal? Gordon was feeling very cross. He puffed into Natford Station one morning, determined to let all of the other engines know how he felt. It's disgraceful, he spluttered. What an abomination. Can you believe how filthy that thing is? Gordon, that's no way to talk about Percy over there, said James cheekily. Hey, exclaimed Percy, that wasn't very nice. Not him, interjected Gordon. The coal depot over there. It's unbelievably messy and dirty. If I had a choice, I wouldn't stick my tender anywhere near that thing. It's a coal depot, said Edward. What do you expect? I know, but it's too untidy, responded Gordon. We need an engine to organize it and make it proper again. Until then, I'll be going on a coal strike if anyone needs me. Suit yourself, chuckled James. I'll gladly pull the express until you wise up. Gordon looked around at his fellow engines. On second thought, my coal strike is now over. Thank you all for your support during this very difficult time. Percy and Edward looked at each other and rolled their eyes. But I've made my point. Sir Topham Hatt needs to find an engine to clean that coal depot up. And surprisingly, Gordon's demands came true just a few days later. Two new engines from the mainland arrived on Sodor, and one of them was going to shunt at the coal depot. Wow, said Toby, those two engines are complete opposites from one another. Yes, indeed, said Flynn. One of them is a steam engine, and the other one's a diesel. Oh, I'm not a diesel, said the engine. My name is Logan, and I'm a steam shunter. I'll be working at the coal mines here. And my name is Sam, said the big green engine. I'm here to replace Gordon on the express. What? gasped Gordon. It can't be. I know I've been running a little late recently, but I promise to... But Sam couldn't help but laugh. I'm sorry, Gordon, he chuckled. I'm not really taking over your express. Some of the mainland engines told me to say that to you when I saw you. They said you would turn as red as Caitlin, and they were right. Oh, speaking of which, hello, Caitlin. Hello, boys, she shouted. Nice to see you on Sodor for a change. Gordon seethed quietly as Sir Topham Hat walked up. Welcome, Sam and Logan, he said proudly. I'm in need of some very special engines for some very special jobs. Sam, you'll be helping the bigger engines pull their heavy trains. 
And Logan, you'll be shunting at the coal depot. Any questions? No, sir, said the engines cheerfully. Excellent, replied Sir Topham Hatt. Get to know your Sodor friends and have a wonderful first day. Well, that was exciting, chuckled Logan. Say, Gordon, care to tell me where I can find the coal mines? But Gordon wanted to get back at the new engines for teasing him. Yes, I can, he said, smiling. The coal mines, is that right? Well then, you're going to want to head all the way across the island until you come to an abandoned mine. Then you can get right to work. Thanks, Gordon, said Logan happily, and he puffed away. And Sam, the big engines usually hang out by the diesel works. You'll find all of the heavy trains you need to pull there. The diesel works, repeated Sam. Got it. Thank you all so much. And Sam puffed away. Gordon, what was that for? asked Flynn. You deliberately sent them to the wrong locations. They're going to be late on their first day of work, protested Toby. That's no way to treat our new friends. Humph, said Gordon indifferently. They'll figure it out eventually, I hope. Meanwhile, Logan had made his way all across the island. He came to a stop in front of a hill with some dinosaur bones sticking out. This isn't right, he said to himself. A coal mine looks nothing like this. A coal mine, asked Sailor John. Ah, shouted Logan. Who are you, and what are you doing here? Oh, uh, I'm, uh, my name is, just call me Captain Callus. I'm, uh, doing some surveying of the land before we dig up this big here dinosaur. It's going to go in the Sodor Museum when we eventually get it out of here. Oh, well, that's nice, replied Logan. Say, there's not any coal inside that mine, is there? Sailor John laughed. No coal, he chuckled. Just some very interesting rocks and jewel. I, I mean, just rocks and all of that other cool geological stuff. Oh, bother, groaned Logan. I'm never going to find my way to the coal mines before the day is done. The coal mines, asked Sailor John. Oh, they don't call them coal mines here on Sodor. What you're looking for is the coal depot. It's right next to Natford Station. Logan let out a big sigh of relief. Oh, you're a lifesaver, Captain Callus. Thank you so much. Please, call me Sailor J... I mean, uh, Captain Callus, at your service. Logan puffed quickly away and finally found his way to the coal depot. He worked hard all day and was exhausted when he was finally done. He met Sam at the sheds that evening. Well, my day certainly was interesting, said Logan. Gordon gave me the wrong directions to the coal mines. Same here, replied Sam. Apparently, the diesel works is not the place where you go to pick up long freight trains. But a nice engine named Diesel was able to help me out. I felt rather silly, admitted Logan, and I'm sure I looked like a fool to Captain Callus. I bet you did, said Sam. If only there was a way to get back at Gordon for what he did to us. I think there is, said Logan cheekily. It may get me in some trouble, but Gordon doesn't deserve to bully us around. The next morning, Gordon was backing up to his train when Duck noticed something. Uh, Gordon, you're running a little low on coal back there. You should probably go fill up before you set off on your journey. Ugh, he groaned. I suppose you're right. I just hope that filthy coal depot has been somewhat cleaned up by that little diesel. But when Gordon arrived at the coal depot, he was shocked to find it completely empty. Where is everything? he asked. Oh dear, said Logan as he puffed up. It appears that someone has stolen all of the coal. Whatever are you going to do? Gordon was in no mood for games and quickly went back to Natford Station. But Sir Topham Hatt wouldn't let him pull the train without a full bunker. James will have to take the express while you go on this coal strike or whatever you called it the other day. No, sir, shouted Gordon. I was only kidding. I was never going to stop filling up on coal. It's, it's Logan. He's behind it. I know he is. 
Not him, said Oliver innocently. He's just a new little engine who you tricked into running all the way across the island yesterday. He would have no reason to be mad at you. Sir Topham Hatt was catching on. Fancy the situation you're in, Gordon. You've been complaining that the coal depot is a mess, and Logan here swept it spotless. He didn't leave a single thing behind. I don't know what you're complaining about. Gordon seethed crossly as James puffed away with the express. Logan then ran up beside Gordon. Two can play at this game, big friend. You give me wrong directions, I hide the rest of the coal. It's that simple. And by the way, I'm a steam engine, not a little diesel. And he wished steam right into Gordon's face. Have fun with your strike, he teased, and Logan puffed brilliantly away. Gordon was at a loss for words. The tiny steamy had outsmarted him in such a small way. But Gordon had learned his lesson. He was never going to mess with little Logan again. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 190, Sam I Am. One evening on the island of Sodor, Logan and Sam had just returned to their sheds after another busy day. Boy, that was something, exclaimed Sam. The way you handled Gordon after he sent you across the island in search of the coal depot was impressive. I don't think he'll be playing any tricks on us soon. Hopefully not, chuckled Logan. I really don't want to embarrass him again. Speaking of embarrassing, said Sam, I had the worst experience at the diesel works the other day. Oh, that's right. Gordon sent you to the wrong place as well. What was that like? Oh, it was terrible, replied Sam. Gordon said I had to go to the diesel works to fetch my heavy train, and I immediately got lost. Excuse me, but do you know where I can find the diesel works? Oh, it's right around the corner, replied Rosie. Thank you so much, said Sam. I owe you one. And Sam puffed around the bend and threw the crossing to the diesel works. He was very surprised when he looked around. There aren't any trucks here, he said to himself. I can't pull a train if there's no train to be found. I wonder if I'm in the right spot. Just then, Diesel rolled onto the turntable. What are you doing here? He asked crossly. Oh, hello! I'm Sam, and I'm visiting from the... Yes, I know you're visiting, interrupted Diesel. A Sodor engine would know that the Diesel Works is for Diesels only. Go away and leave us alone. Oh, sorry, said Sam. I was just looking for a freight train to pull. Gordon sent me here and... Wait a minute, said Diesel. Gordon sent you... Here? To the Diesel Works? To pull a freight train? Yes, that's correct, all right, shouted Sam. Diesel looked over at Sydney. You know what this means, don't you, Sydney? Yes, I do. Well, I, I think I do. Actually, to be quite honest, oh, never mind, said Diesel. Well then, Sam, you've actually come to the right place. I was just testing you to make sure you knew what you were doing, and you've passed. Oh, uh, hooray then, exclaimed Sam. I'll get your cars ready for you, continued Diesel. Meet me in the yard tomorrow morning, and your train will be ready to go. Thank you very much, said Sam, and he puffed away. Uh, Diesel, where's this train that Sam's going to pull? Oh, I'll find some old trucks and throw something together. What we really need is for Den to get back from the mainland. Oh, here he comes, shouted Sidney. Excellent, said Diesel. Welcome back, welcome back. And how was Operation Rescue Dart? It was a success, chuckled Den. They really don't care what you do over on the mainland. I had some workmen put this silly disguise over Dart, and we cruised right on out of there. Hi there, Diesel, shouted Dart. Yes, hello, hello, snickered Diesel. This is perfect. We can put Dart in the middle of Sam's train, and he'll have no idea what's holding him back when he tries to move. Oh, said Dart sadly. Well, actually, I was hoping I could get out of my disguise. 
I look quite silly, don't you think? No, you look brilliant, said Diesel. And the longer you wear that disguise, the longer Sir Topham Hatt won't recognize you. Oh, that's a good idea, snickered Sidney. Then it's settled, continued Diesel. Tomorrow morning, I'll put Sam's train together and sneak a dart somewhere in line between the freight cars. Then all you need to do is tell the trucks to put their brakes on, as well as your own, and Sam won't be able to go anywhere. That's a brilliant plan, Diesel, agreed Den. I just wish you and I had a disguise so that we could join Dart. Oh, please, don't be silly. We would look quite ridiculous. And Diesel rolled quickly away. The next day, Sam puffed into the yard where his train was waiting. Diesel was just finishing putting the last cars in order. And there we go. Are you ready, Dart? <laughs> ready, he snickered quietly. Sam was coupled to the train. A small group of engines had gathered at Knapford Station. Well, this should be interesting, quipped Duck. That's one of the biggest trains I've ever seen, gasped Oliver. I wonder if he's going to be able to pull it, said James quietly. We're all set, smiled Diesel. When you're ready, Sam. Great, and thank you, Diesel. You may not know this, but there are some mean engines on my railway. But you're definitely one of the kindest I've ever met. When I return to the mainland, I'll tell all of my friends what a nice engine you are. Diesel was touched by what Sam had said. It wasn't every day he was praised as highly as this. Yes, he managed to say. Good luck. Sam blew his whistle and began to move his wheels. Hold back! Hold back! whispered Dart. Pass the word along. Whoa, you can talk, said one of the trucks. Who does this guy think he is? Nobody gives orders around here except for Scruffy. What's going on back there? Instead of bothering Sam, the trucks began to put all of their weight against Dart near the back of the train. Oh no, gasped Dart. This isn't good. Diesel realized what was happening. Stop, Sam, stop, he shouted. The trucks, they're, they're playing tricks. I know they are. They're no trouble for an engine like me. Sam, I am. That's what I like to say. Even with their brakes on, the trucks couldn't hold back Sam any longer. With a mighty heave, his wheels dug into the rails and he pulled the long train away. Diesel! Diesel! Help! shouted Dart as he passed by. Uh-oh, said Diesel. Uh, Sam! Sam! Wait up! Does anyone know where that train is headed? asked James. I think it's going to the mainland, replied Oliver. That was impressive, said Duck. Even with all of those trucks pulling against him, Sam still managed to puff away with ease. What? gasped Den. Sam left with the train? And it's going to the mainland? Uh-oh, I need to rescue Dart. And Den rushed away. What about Dart? asked James. Do we even know a Dart? questioned Oliver. You silly engines, laughed Gordon. There's no one on Sodor named Dart. Uh, Gordon, you're running a little low on coal back there. And that's right before you played your trick on Gordon, concluded Sam. Wow, what a great story, said Logan. Yep, of course, I wasn't there for the whole thing, but I don't think anything major happened while I was gone. Well, I'm glad your trip was a success, said Logan. I really like it here on Sodor. Do you? You know, I actually do. I wouldn't mind staying here once in a while. Me too, said Logan. Well, I'm getting tired. Good night, Sam. Good night, Logan, he replied. And the two engines closed their eyes and quickly fell asleep. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 191, Toad Gets Toad. One morning, Duck puffed into Tidmouth Station with a goods train. It was eerily silent all around. Where is everyone? He asked Oliver. There are no passengers, no coaches, and no station master. What's going on? 
Apparently, nobody wants to go near the seaside in this frigid weather, chuckled Oliver. My driver says it will be like this until well after Christmas. It looks like you and I will get a break just in time for the holidays. That will be nice, admitted Duck. But what are you doing here with Toad if you've got no train to pull? Oh, the yard needs all the help it can get right now. I'm going to take Toad down to Knapford where he can still be really useful. A change in scenery will be quite nice, Mr. Duck, smiled Toad. Indeed, replied Duck. Well, have fun down there today. Oliver puffed away and soon arrived at Knapford Station where he dropped Toad off in a siding. I'll be back to pick you up this evening, said Oliver. Don't have too much fun while I'm gone. Will do, Mr. Oliver, laughed Toad, and Oliver puffed away. Hmm, it's awfully busy here. I hope I don't get run over. Just then, Spencer raced by with his coaches. Ooh, exclaimed Toad. That was a little too close for comfort. There you are, said Stafford. You're needed on Douglas's train. Let's go. Right ho, Mr. Stafford. I'm ready to be useful again. But what Toad didn't realize was that Douglas and Neville were sitting right next to each other at the platform, and Stafford had gotten their trains mixed up since the two engines were the same color. There's my whistle, said Neville. Bye, Douglas. Goodbye, Neville. Wait, Toad? Is that you? Where are you going? Mr. Douglas, cried Toad. But whose train is this then? But Neville was already on his way down the line. Their first stop was at the docks, and Toad was relieved when he came to a halt. About time. Whoever is pulling this train, you need to go back to Knapford Station and put me with Mr. Douglas. We work very well together, you know. But Neville wasn't used to a talking brake van and thought Toad's voice belonged to one of his trucks. You seem to be quite upset, said Skiff. I am, replied Toad. I was put on the wrong train and that engine up there won't listen to me. Say, can you tell me who it is so I can get their attention? I'll do my best, said Skiff. I haven't been on Sodor very long and I don't know all of the engine's names yet. Oh, right. Can you tell me what color he or she is? Uh, black, shouted Skiff. All over, even the wheels. There's even a tender attached. Toad began to chuckle. Oh, this must be a prank, he said, laughing. I bet Mr. Donald has taken Mr. Douglas's train, and they're waiting to see how long it takes for me to realize they've switched jobs. Ah, oh, classic Scottish twins. Skiff, shouted Sailor John. Keep your voice down. No talking about anything to engines or cabooses. Oh, sorry, Sailor John, said Skiff quietly. Toad looked suspiciously at the man next to Skiff. He knew that Sailor John ran the dynamite stand near Arlsberg West, but that was about it. Let's go, shouted Sailor John. The wintry winds be picking up. We best be heading along before they die down. Yes, sir, replied Skiff. Oh, bye, Toad. It was nice seeing you again. Skiff, what did I tell you about talking to anyone else? Toad watched as Skiff and Sailor John rolled out of the docks. That man is quite mean, said Toad. Oh, it looks like we're going again. Neville made his way down the line before stopping at the wharf. Toad was beginning to grow concerned. Uh, Mr. Donald, what are we doing over here? This isn't Mr. Douglas's usual route. But once again, Neville didn't respond. I suppose I should stop worrying, admitted Toad. Mr. Donald knows what he's doing. Just then, Toad spotted Skiff out of the corner of his eye. He and Sailor John were flying down the rails, and they nearly collided with Neville as he was leaving. Toad was growing suspicious. Shouldn't Mr. Sailor John be at the dynamite stand, especially during this busy holiday season? Why are he and Mr. Skiff running around the island like that? But he kept those thoughts to himself. A few moments later, Neville was on his way again. 
as they went around a large curve near Tidmouth Sheds, Toad was finally able to get a good look at the engine that was pulling his train. That's not Mr. Donald or Mr. Douglas, he cried. That's Mr. Neville. Stop! Stop! But Toad's voice was carried away by the strong winds. There must be some mistake, gasped Toad. I shouldn't be on this train. I must stop at once. He applied his brakes as hard as he could. Neville began to slow, but he figured it was just the trucks playing tricks. He gave a hefty heave and the coupling snapped. Toad was left stranded on the line as Neville puffed away. Oh, bother, groaned Toad. I didn't mean for that to happen. I just wanted to slow Mr. Neville down enough so that I could get his attention. The wind on the viaduct was picking up. Toad began to feel himself being pushed along the rails. He locked his brakes down for good. Oh dear, he thought. If an engine comes along, I could get run over and busted into smithereens. Maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea to let the wind take me to the nearest station where I can get some help. Just then, Toad heard a whistle. The track beneath him began to rumble. Oh no, he cried. It's Gordon. He's going to run over me at full speed. Toad shut his eyes as the engine grew closer and closer. This is how it ends, he mumbled sadly. Suddenly, Toad heard the screeching of wheels on the rails and the engine stopped just in time. There you are, said Harvey. What? gasped Toad. I mean, oh, yes, here I am. Douglas said he saw you on the wrong train earlier today. I'm here to take you back to Knapford Station where Oliver is waiting for you. Oh, bless you, Mr. Harvey, said Toad graciously, and he was hooked up to the breakdown crane and towed away. Looks like the rogue brake van has been caught, chuckled Oliver. You've caused a lot of panic today, Toad. My apologies, Mr. Oliver. It seems as though I spent the whole day on the wrong assignment with Mr. Neville instead of Mr. Douglas. I'm just happy this escapade has a happy ending, said Oliver. I thought you could have been in some serious trouble out there, especially with how strong the wind has been. Just then, Skiff and Sailor John rolled by again. Toad began to think back on what he had seen earlier that day. Yes, he said quietly. I just hope everyone else out there gets rescued like I did. What are you talking about, Toad? Nothing. Let's go home, Mr. Oliver, where it's nice and warm. And Oliver and Toad puffed out of the yard back to the safety and comfort of the Little Western. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 192, Ivo Hughes' Day at the Zoo. On the Scarloe Railway, there's a small animal park where visitors can get a close look at some of Sodor's finest creatures. The passengers board some cars at the Glenox Switch Tower, and an engine takes them around the short yet exciting trip through the zoo. Today, it was Ivo Hughes' turn to give the tour, but he was not very pleased. These animals are rather stinky things, he complained. I'd rather risk my cab at Boulder Mountain than do this. Oh, hello, Bertram. Looking good, I must say. Ivo Hughes' first passengers of the morning were the Duke and Duchess of Boxford. They had never been on a tour before and wanted to see what all the fuss was about. Go slow, Ivo Hugh, said the Duke. I'm so used to Spencer flying down the line that this will be a nice change of pace. Ivo Hugh was not thrilled with his job, but set off anyway. When they came to the first enclosure, he came to a stop and let the Duke and Duchess look at the animals. Well, that's interesting, said the Duke. I was expecting something a little more exciting, added the Duchess. Ivo Hugh wasn't paying attention. He had noticed a railboat flying down the track and was very intrigued by it. Um, Ivo Hugh, said the Duke, what is this? Oh, gasped Ivo Hugh, I'm sorry, this is a zebra. They are most commonly found in... What zebra? asked the Duchess. In fact, where are all of the animals? 
Ivo Hugh finally looked around. He hadn't noticed it before, but there were no animals in their enclosures. This is a rather desolate zoo, said the Duke. Oh, this is bad, said Ivo Hugh quietly. I need to take you back to the junction. It appears all of the animals have gotten out. Ivo Hugh backed up and the Duke and Duchess got off. Don't worry, he said. When I find all of the animals, I'll be back and we can continue the tour from where we left off. The Duke and Duchess were not pleased, but they didn't have much of a choice. Ivo Hugh raced down the line to the incline where Sir Handel and Rusty were working. Have any of you seen some animals from the zoo? He asked quickly. Oh, you mean like that giraffe up there? Chuckled Rusty. Ivo Hugh looked up. There was a giraffe from the animal park sitting on top of the incline. How did he get up there? asked Ivo Hugh. That's a steep climb. I think he's looking for some food up in those trees on Coldy's line, chuckled Sir Handel. Oh dear, sighed Ivo Hugh. How are we going to get him down? Just then, the giraffe climbed into one of the open slate cars at the top of the incline. Here's our chance, shouted Rusty. Send the cars down. Moments later, the giraffe was safely on the ground and Ivo Hughes' driver and fireman corralled him into one of the zoo cars. Thanks, everyone, said Ivo Hugh. I have some more animals to catch, so I'll see you later. Next, Ivo Hugh headed down the line to the steamworks. He wasn't surprised to find the elephant entertaining Victor and Kevin when he puffed in. There you are, said Ivo Hugh. Sorry to end the show early, but I need to take this pesky elephant back to the animal park where he belongs. That's a shame, said Victor. He was showing us some of his favorite tricks. I would give him more peanuts if I had any, said Kevin, except I'm all out. The workmen glared at Kevin from across the steamworks. Those peanuts didn't belong to you, Kevin, said Victor. They belong to the workmen who brought them as a snack for later. You should feel very ashamed. Kevin grinned sheepishly at Ivo Hugh. Just then, Henry puffed in. Victor, I think I'm coming down with another case of boiler A. Ah, ah, what is he doing here? Get out, get out. And Henry raced away as quickly as he'd come in. What was that about? asked Ivo Hugh. I'm not sure, replied Victor. Apparently, Henry doesn't like elephants. A few minutes later, the elephant was loaded onto Ivo Hugh's train and he set off once again. He found the tiger sitting on the tracks at the wharf where Colin was letting him play with his hook. Ivo Hugh then spotted the lion under the bridge near Boulder Mountain. That's almost everybody, he said. We just need to find that zebra. And Ivo Hugh puffed away to Ulfstead Castle. It took a little bit of searching, but he finally spotted the zebra in a field next to the station. At last, I can finally get back to the animal park and give the Duke and Duchess their tour. Ivo Hugh's driver and fireman went out to the field to get the zebra. Just then, Ivo Hugh noticed something in the distance. It was the rail boat he had seen earlier, and it had just stopped in front of the old abandoned mine tunnel. Who is that man? wondered Ivo Hugh. I've never seen him before. Sailor John had gotten out and was looking at the entrance to the tunnel. Just then, Connor puffed by with a long train full of passengers. The coaches obscured Ivo Hugh's view of what was going on. And when they all finally passed, Sailor John and Skiff had vanished. W what? gasped Ivo Hugh. Where did they go? Connor, did you see that? See what? asked Connor. That man in his ship dinghy thing. They were just over there and then you puffed by and now they're gone. Oh, sorry, replied Connor. I wasn't paying any attention. I was making sure I could stop in the right spot with all of these heavy coaches. Apparently, passengers like coming to Ulfstead Castle during the holidays. That's why my train is so long. But Ivo Hugh wasn't listening. His driver and fireman had returned with the zebra. 
Did you see that? He asked them. Did you see that man with his boat over there? Sorry, but we were busy with the zebra, said his fireman. We don't know what you're talking about. You've had a long day, Ivo Hugh, said his driver. Let's get all of these animals back to the zoo and you can have a rest. Ivo Hugh was sad and disappointed. He knew he had seen something suspicious, but with no one around him willing to validate his claim, he felt incredibly silly. I guess you're right, he said wearily. Let's go. At last, Ivo Hugh returned to the animal park. The Duke and Duchess were still waiting, and Sir Topham Hatt had joined them. Well done, Ivo Hugh. I heard that some animals had escaped from the zoo and hurried over as fast as I could. You've done a marvelous job collecting them all back up again. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, replied Ivo Hugh. Now, said the Duke, how about that tour? But Ivo Hugh was worn out. He had traveled all over the Scarloe Railway, and the animals had made his train very heavy. I think I can help, came Bertram's voice. Why don't I take this one while you head back to the sheds? Ivo Hugh had never been more grateful. Oh, thank you, Bertram. You've just made this little engine very happy. Fine with me, said Sir Topham Hatt. Enjoy your rest while you can, Ivo Hugh, because tomorrow you're on zoo duty again. Ivo Hugh rolled his eyes. How fitting, he chuckled, and he puffed away to get a good night's rest. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 193, Side Plates and Skirmishes. Stepney and Flora work at Great Waterton Station, which is hidden back in the hills of Sodor. While Stepney enjoys his branch line, Flora finds it boring and the work can be sporadic due to the weather. I don't want to be cooped up here during Christmas time, she complained one morning. There's so much more to see out there besides this same old station. Stepney was a little irritated. Fine, he said. If you don't like it here, then go make yourself useful somewhere else. Stepney wasn't exactly serious, but Flora saw her chance and went with it. She quickly puffed away, leaving Stepney alone on the branch line. Oh, he said quietly. Well, have fun then. Flora was excited at the new scenery and she quickly pulled into Olfstead Castle. All of the engines were very busy preparing for the upcoming Christmas celebration. It will be marvelous, touted Stephen. The Earl is ordering the biggest tree you've ever seen. I bet it's going to tower over the castle walls. How wonderful, chuffed Flora. If I can, I might just sneak away from Great Waterton on Christmas to come see it. Speaking of which, what exactly are you doing here? asked Toby. Oh, Stepney's being an old fusspot again. I'm sure he can handle things. What can I do to help with the decorating? Well, said Stephen, I was supposed to give a tour today, but Toby volunteered to pull it for me. You can join him, I suppose. Oh, yes, how fun! And Flora puffed away to the station. Toby was a bit apprehensive. Although he and Flora were friends, she was much more exciting and loud than he was used to. Looks like I have someone to keep me company, he said dryly, and he quickly followed her. Toby went to go fetch Stephen's open coaches for the tour, but Flora had already arrived at Ulfstead Station with her own tram coach. No, Flora, you can't use that, protested Toby. These are the official tour coaches for Ulfstead Castle. Nobody will be able to see anything outside of your big van there. It's not a van, wished Flora crossly. It's a tram coach, and it will do a much better job than those old things. Climb aboard, everyone. There's not a moment to lose. The passengers were confused. They didn't realize Flora was taking them on a tour since Toby had the open coaches right behind her. I guess this is our engine, said the children, and they climbed aboard. 
See, said Flora, the passengers like my coach. So be it, conceded Toby, but don't leave without me. I need to show you the line to take so that the passengers get to see the entire castle. No need to, interrupted Flora. I have eyes, Toby. I can see where the track goes. Goodbye. And Flora pulled away with the passengers. Toby was growing cross. Fine, he said to himself. If Flora thinks she knows what to do, then who am I to try and stop her? Meanwhile, Flora was having a blast. She was so excited that she raced along the rails much too quickly, and the passengers didn't have time to admire the castle. Slow down, they yelled, and Flora finally did. She was about to re-enter the castle grounds when the track in front of her mysteriously shifted and revealed another line below it. Ooh, that looks exciting, she said. Let's go that way. But Flora was going in the wrong direction. Instead of continuing along the tour line, she ended up leaving Olsted Castle and heading towards Great Waterton. Flora, what are you doing here? asked Stepney. Come back to help me with the passengers. Oh, never again, she laughed. This is way more fun. But Flora soon got lost. She rarely traveled outside of the Great Waterton area and had no idea where she was going. Hmm, I guess we go this way, she proclaimed and set off again. Ooh, this looks spooky, like a haunted house. Would you all like to take a visit? Not particularly, said the passengers. This place is old and smells weird. But Flora didn't listen. She ran across the turntable and around the bend to where Airy was resting comfortably. Oh, this is a dead end, said Flora sadly. Guess we have to turn around. You better, grunted Airy. The diesel works is for diesels only. The passengers screamed as Flora rushed away. Toby had been watching from behind the wall and had seen everything. This is not going well, he said, and he raced down the line after them. Meanwhile, Flora was still lost. She could see the castle in the distance, but had no idea how to get there. I'm cold, said one of the children. Let's head back to the station where it's nice and warm. Yes, quite right, agreed Flora. Oh, look, here's a station. But it wasn't Olstead Station. Flora couldn't drop the passengers off here. Uh, maybe it's down the line just a little way, she said to herself. But Flora continued to get more and more lost. Instead of asking for help, she kept on assuming she was on the right track back until she didn't arrive at the castle after all. Where are we? asked the children. Oh dear, we're finally lost, cried Flora. I don't know how I'm going to get us back to the station, and I'm nearly out of coal. Flora and the passengers were stranded by Gordon's Hill, and they had no way of getting help. Meanwhile, Toby was trying to track them down. Did Flora come through here a while ago? he asked quickly. Yes, she went that way, said Boko. She looked confused, but didn't say anything. Flora's too proud to admit when she needs help, sighed Toby, and he set off once again. After following the clues from fellow engines, Toby finally found them at the bottom of Gordon's Hill. Look, it's Toby, cried Flora. We're saved, hooray! The passengers were very happy that they were going to be rescued. Where are you heading? chuckled Toby. This doesn't look like Ulfsted Castle. I know it's not, and I'm sorry, said Flora sadly. I thought I knew everything about giving tours at the castle, but I obviously don't. Will you push us back to Ulfsted Station so that these nice people can go home? I think I have a better idea, smiled Toby, and he pushed Flora and her tram to Knapford Station. What are we doing here? This isn't Olfsted Castle. As Toby switched lines, the passengers headed inside MC Bun, where there was hot food and drinks waiting for them. 
Oh, wow. How thoughtful of you, Toby. I've had many years of experience pulling Henrietta, he replied. I know when it's time to stop and feed your passengers. Otherwise, they'll become cross and hungry. I should have listened to you, admitted Flora. In fact, you should be the one to take them back to the castle. I've messed up too much for one day. Absolutely not. You started this tour and you're going to finish it. I guess you're right, mumbled Flora. Besides, added Toby, if Sir Topham Hatt is waiting for you, then I don't want to be the one to get in trouble. Flora couldn't help but laugh. Once the passengers had reboarded, Toby gave her some of his coal and she followed his directions to get back to the station. Flora, we're running a bit late, aren't we? asked Sir Topham Hatt. My apologies, sir. I got a little carried away with the tour. It was awesome, shouted the children. We got to see the whole entire island, and we even stopped for desserts at MC Bun. It was a lot of fun. Interesting, said Sir Topham Hatt. Well, as long as the passengers are happy, then I can't complain. Good job, Flora. But I think Stepney wants you back on his branch line starting tomorrow. Yes, sir, she said. It will be nice to get back there again. And the next day, Flora returned to Great Waterton. She had enjoyed her adventure, but she knew she belonged on Stepney's branch line where things were a little more peaceful and predictable. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 194, Hector and Logan's Hot Pursuit. One morning, Mavis was getting ready to leave Marin Station with a quarry train when Skiff and Sailor John cut right in front of her. Oh, she gasped, not again. Watch where you're going and keep off the main line, you silly things. How rude and inconsiderate, said Trevor. I've seen them all over the railway. They're always darting in and out of traffic with no regard for anyone else. It's about time something was done, she added. Eventually, there's going to be an accident. Later that day, Mavis arrived at Knapford Station to find that Sir Topham Hatt was holding a meeting with all of the engines. That pirate and his railboat thing almost made me crash this morning, complained Percy. Same here, added Mavis. Those two are extremely dangerous. See, sir, exclaimed Gordon, just another example of the chaos this Skiff and Sailor John fellow are causing. They don't abide by any rules or regulations, added Ryan. As long as the wind is blowing, you can bet they're on the rails somewhere, causing heaps of trouble. I see, said Sir Topham Hatt. Frankly, I didn't know the situation had gotten worse. The last I heard, that rail boat was brought in to give rides at Arlesburg Harbor. But I've never seen him there, said Duck. He's always running around the island with Sailor John instead. Well then, I suppose it's time to bring this to a stop. Thank you all for your input. Duck, will you please take me to Sailor John's dynamite stand so I can have a word with him and his rail boat? Sir Topham Hatt climbed aboard and Duck puffed away. They'll be lucky to find him there, Weesh Gordon quietly. Those two are never where you think they're going to be. Just then, Logan puffed in with Hector to add him to a goods train. Oh, never mind, Logan, said Hector. Duck just puffed away with Sir Topham Hatt. Looks like this train won't be going after all. What a bummer, sighed Logan. I brought you all the way from the coal depot for this. Guess we'll have to go back. We should help Sir Topham Hatt try and catch that pirate, said Percy. If any of you see him, make sure he doesn't get away again. Interesting, said Logan. Let's keep an eye out, Hector. Later that day, Logan was on his way back to the coal depot when Hector spotted Skiff and Sailor John in one of the sightings. Shh, whispered Hector. Stop. Look, it's Sailor John and the railboat. 
Cinders and ashes, cried Logan. We should tell somebody. Hold on, they're talking about something. Let me see if I can hear them. But Sailor John, we don't need to do that, protested Skiff. I know it's important to you, but it isn't important to me. I'd rather be at Arlsberg Harbor giving tours to the children. Stow your tour and talk, shouted Sailor John. That was just a ploy to get you on Sodor. Now that you're my boat, we'll be doing things my way. You mean I won't actually be giving the children boat rides at all? Uh, maybe if there come a day where I don't need to be running around this island without your assistance, then yes, you can do that instead. But Skiff was upset. I didn't sign up for this, Sailor John. You lied to me. All this time we've been running around and I thought you were up to something important. Turns out you're just looking for the- Oh, watch out, cried Bill. Logan, what are you doing in the middle of the track here? Shh, be quiet, whispered Logan. But Sailor John had seen everything. He quickly hopped aboard Skiff and raised the sail. Looks like we got some eavesdroppers over here, he laughed. Try and catch us, you big coal car. And the wind swept Skiff and Sailor John down the track. Quick, let's get after them, said Hector. But I can't see, shouted Logan. Where am I supposed to go? Don't worry, I'll be your guide. There's no time to lose. And the two raced away after them. On the other side of the island, Sir Topham Hatt had arrived at Sailor John's dynamite stand, but the devious pirate was nowhere to be found. Who needs this much dynamite anyway? asked Duck. It's a bit of an overload, don't you think? Just then, Bert puffed up. Hello, sir. Can I help you with something? Yes, have you seen Sailor John around lately? I need to speak with him immediately. No, sir, replied Bert. He hasn't been here that much recently. The lorries are doing all of the delivering for him. Delivering, asked Sir Topham Hatt. I'm surprised there's that much of a demand for dynamite on this island. Personally, I don't think a lot of people are buying it. It seems as though he's mostly moving it from this location to another, if you ask me. Interesting, said Sir Topham Hatt. Thank you, Bert. Well, Duck, what do you think this Sailor John is up to? Certainly something to look into, he replied. I agree, said Sir Topham Hatt. Come on, let's go check out the progress on the Ulfsted Christmas decorations. Maybe we can find something there. Meanwhile, Kelly, Oliver, and Byron had finished putting the sign back together outside of the abandoned mine. There we go, exclaimed Kelly. Now everybody will know that it's not safe to enter the mine here. Just then, Skiff and Sailor John rolled up. Arr, we can't go inside now with all of these scallywags hanging about. We'll have to come back later. Oh, look out, cried Skiff. Here comes the big truck and the engine. Sailor John quickly ran inside the signal house and changed the points while no one was looking. Logan and Hector rounded the bend, smashed through the sign, and ended up getting stuck in the tunnel door. Har har har, laughed Sailor John. Mind your own business, everybody, or there will be more from where that came from. No, don't let them get away, shouted Logan, but he was derailed and the road vehicles didn't know what he was talking about. Logan, what are you doing? asked Oliver. You've ruined the new sign. Just then, Duck and Sir Topham Hatt pulled up to find an incredible mess waiting for them. Logan, he shouted, what is the meaning of this? Were you trying to enter this mine here? It's strictly forbidden. That's why the sign is, uh, rather was, there. No, sir, I was trying to catch Captain Callus, and he... Whoa, Captain Callus, asked Byron. Now that's a name I haven't heard in a long time, chuckled Duck. Why? asked Logan. What's so funny? Captain Callus lived a long, long time ago, said Kelly. He's a myth, an urban legend at best. 
No, that pirate man was Captain Callus, protested Logan. That's what he told me when I saw him here a few months ago. A few months ago, asked Sir Topham Hatt. Next to this abandoned mine, Logan, you're... You're not working with Sailor John, are you? Of course not, but Hector and I were just trying to stop him. Leave Hector out of this, said Sir Topham Hatt. You've only made the situation worse. This wild goose chase around the railway was dangerous and unacceptable. Logan realized he was as much of the problem as Sailor John was. Maybe you aren't such a good fit for Sodor after all, said Sir Topham Hatt quietly. Trying to aid Sailor John and breaking down this mine door are two things that a really useful engine would not do. I suggest you clean yourself up and head back to the mainland. Yes, sir, he said sadly. It's all my fault. I've been dealing with the bad guy this whole time and I can't be trusted anymore. As Duck puffed away, Sir Topham Hatt was relieved that he had finally gotten to the bottom of the Sailor John issue. Or so he thought. Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Wooden Railway Adventures, Episode 195, How Gator Stole Christmas. It was Christmas Day on the island of Sodor, and all of the engines were busy finishing up their final train so that they could go to Ulfsted Castle for the party. The Earl was playing a massive celebration full of holiday cheer, and the engines did not want to miss it. Let's go, let's go, shouted Bolstrode. Get these packages out of here so that we can be done for the day. You're not in a very cheerful mood, giggled Gator. Not when you're stuck in this freezing water, replied Bolstrode. Combined with the wind, it has been a miserable day. Just then, Thomas puffed in. He had one more stop at the docks on the way back to his branch line. Thomas, said Gator, good to see you. Staying warm, I hope? I'm trying, laughed Thomas. What are you doing here? I have a very important delivery to pick up, said Gator. A special special, so to speak. Oh, not one of those, cried Thomas. Those things are dreadful. No, it's not like that, chuckled Gator. Sir Topham Hatt told me to keep it a secret, but I will say that it's very essential to the Earl's Christmas party. Interesting, said Thomas. I can't wait to see what it is and he puffed away. All right, Gator, said Cranky. Your special cargo has arrived. As soon as the ship pulled in, Gator's trucks were filled with decorations, presents, and a festive Christmas tree for all of the engines. How wonderful, said Gator. This is going to be an awesome Christmas party. It sure looks like it, added Cranky. I think I can see the Earl's massive Christmas tree all the way from here. Gator chuckled. Nice try, Cranky. I know it's not that big. Well, I better be off. Merry Christmas, everyone. And Gator puffed out of the docks. Just then, Lori too raced in. Where's Gator? He asked. I need to tell him something. He just left a moment ago, replied Bulstrode. Why, what's going on? No time to explain, but I have to reach Gator as soon as possible. He went that way, said Cranky. If you're quick, maybe you can catch him. Lori too was in a hurry and raced after Gator. It took a while and there was a lot of swerving and skidding by Lori too, but he was finally able to catch up. Stop, Gator, stop! I've gotten an important message from Sir Topham Hatt. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry I didn't slow down earlier. I thought you were looking for a race. No worries, said Lori too. Sir Topham Hatt sent a message saying that all of these gifts and the Christmas tree need to be dropped off outside of Olfsted Castle instead of by the turntable like before. I wonder why there's been a change in plans, asked Gator. I'm not sure. 
Maybe Sir Topham Hatt and the Earl want to surprise everybody with the gifts, so they'd rather not have you puffing in with everyone watching. Ooh, that's a good point, said Gator. Oh, I can hardly contain my excitement. Thanks, Lori, too. And Gator puffed away. It was windy all the way to Ulfstead, but he finally arrived outside of the castle walls. Well, I'm here, he said quietly. Hello? Sir Topham Hatt? Is anyone here? But everything was silent. Oh, bother. I wonder if I'm in the right spot. No, you're fine, came a voice. It was Sailor John. He had just popped out of the mine, but Gator hadn't seen that. Who are you? he inquired. My name's, uh, Captain Callus. I'm here to pick up the presents for Sir Topham Hatt and the Earl. But where are they, and why are you here instead? Oh, they're busy entertaining the guests and engines in the castle, said Sailor John. They'll be along in just a bit. But I've been ordered to take all of the gifts out and prepare them for distribution when the time is right. Hmm... I guess that sounds okay, said Gator, and Sailor John gradually removed everything from the cars. Perfect. Then when Sir Topham Hatt and the Earl arrive, everything will be nice and laid out. That's a great idea, said Gator. Well, I guess I'll go enjoy the party. Thanks, Captain Callus. And Gator puffed away. A few minutes later, he arrived at the turntable in the castle. There were engines and decorations everywhere. What a party, he exclaimed. Oh, looking quite festive, Thomas. Thanks, Gator. Say, where's that special special you were talking about? I left it outside, just like Sir Topham Hatt wanted. Oh, I didn't know he asked for that, said Thomas suspiciously. Just then, Sir Topham Hatt walked over, and Thomas explained what was going on. I didn't request that, he said quietly. Let's go see what the matter is. But when the three of them arrived, all of the packages and the Christmas tree were gone. Where are all of the gifts? asked Gator. Captain Callus said he was going to watch them. Very funny, chuckled Thomas. This Captain Callus fellow is a great excuse for when things go wrong. But Gator wasn't listening. I think I've ruined Christmas, he added sadly. No, you haven't, said Sir Topham Hatt. Don't worry, Gator. It was an honest mistake. With the weather we've had lately, I wouldn't be surprised if a gust of wind came up and blew everything away. Anyway, let's go back and enjoy the party, shall we? Besides, Christmas isn't about presents, and we don't need those material gifts to be happy. Meanwhile, deep inside the Ulfstead mine, Sailor John and Skiff were enjoying the Christmas decorations and presents. Har, 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 laughed Sailor John. What an unpleasant surprise this Christmas day. Free holiday goodies, all for us, Skiff. But Skiff was a little uncertain. This is wrong, Sailor John. You shouldn't have told Lori too to lie to Gator like that. We should be sharing these presents with everyone else. Relax, you dinghy. Just a simple miscommunication, that's all. And once this Christmas storm passes through tomorrow, we'll turn our attention to getting this beautiful treasure out of here. Then what? asked Skiff. Who knows? laughed Sailor John. The possibilities are endless. But everybody will be wanting a piece of this treasure once they know it's up for grabs. You and I, but mostly me, are going to become more rich and powerful than that fat man himself. Then will I be able to give the children tours at Alsberg Harbor? asked Skiff. Yes, yes, fine. If that's all you want, then once we're done, you can do that. Skiff and Sailor John were having a very merry but stolen Christmas, so to speak. But they weren't the only ones who weren't at the party. Logan was alone in a shed off of the main line. 
Sir Topham Hatt will never trust me again, he said sadly. Everything I do, everything I say, he'll think that Sailor John is behind it. And the only thing I can do is to head back to the mainland, where all of those mean diesels are. Back at the Christmas party, nobody had any idea about Logan or Skiff or Sailor John. They were too busy enjoying the festivities, especially the Earl's massive Christmas tree. Cranky wasn't kidding, laughed Gator. This tree is massive, and it towers over the castle walls, just like I predicted, chuckled Stephen. Where's Logan? asked Sam. Has anybody seen him? Look, the Earl's about to unveil the new narrow-gauge engine. Sir, Hector has just gotten back from being repaired. He says he needs to tell you something immediately. Keep calm, Dart. Keep calm. Wow, what a wonderful Christmas this has turned out to be, said Thomas. Surrounded by all of our friends, big and small. There's nothing more I could ask for. Merry Christmas, everyone, and thanks for a great year!